Pastor. Thank you, everybody, for welcoming me into your home. Uh, so honored to be here with you. Please, please have a seat. I want you to be comfortable. Um, feel free to lean back, put your feet up on the person's shoulders in front of you. <laughs> Well, uh, it, it really is an honor to be here, and I, I, I've never been here before, and thank you. What a, what a beautiful place to worship God. And I know your pastor is truly a man of faith. He probably talked it over with his wife, um, and together, they're exercising a lot of faith here, because the special guest this morning is from California. And, more, and sketchier than that, as far as me being a Christian, I'm also an actor. I could be faking the whole thing. <laughs> right? So I know that this is a church that is driven by faith. Well, I, I, I do find myself um, with fear and trembling when I, I think of opening up the Word of God and offering a message that is representing the words of God and the gospel of God. And so I just uh, thank you and, and ask if, if we could just pray together before we go any further this morning. Would you do that with me? Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you would <clears throat> look upon us even though we have demonstrated our ability to, de to dive into depths of depravity as a human race so deep that... That God, you, you, you even, as Pastor said, it, 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 it grieved you that you had even made mankind and that you had flooded the earth and, and yet you've not given us according to what we deserve here today. You have poured out your grace and kindness and mercy and you've given us a savior. God, it's not about our religious performance that pleases you. It is Jesus who performed on our behalf and he took upon himself our failures and our sin. And so we just give you praise and thanks this morning and ask for you to open our eyes to see what we are blind to and to open our ears to hear what we need. And God, fill us with your spirit and produce within us that sweet fruit of love and joy and peace and self-control. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I, I'm apart from my family this morning and I just want you to meet them. My wife, Chelsea, and I met on the set of Growing Pains. Uh, we were boyfriend and girlfriend on the show back in the 1980s. For those of you who uh, may have been on, in, in, in the Growing Pains fan club back in the day, I think we've got it, there they are. And all six of our children all our kids are grown up now and they moved out of the house and so they're all over the country and we're empty nesters and we're kind of looking for, you know, what do we do now? Where do we go? We want to be with our kids. But as I've considered the world that our kids are growing up in, it's really driven me to want to leave a legacy of doing things, not just thinking about things and talking about things. Pastor Luke had mentioned in the previous service that I believe it was your brother who was talking about being more than just relevant, being revolutionary. And instead of talking about bad politics, start a civics ministry at your church. Instead of just talking about the homelessness problem and the hunger problem, let's start a program that's going to feed and house people who are in need. I'm, I'm all about that for the sake of my kids and for the sake of the gospel. So if you haven't uh, heard this, I wanna give you just, uh, bring it up to speed. I've been in the news a little bit lately, and here's the story. So a year ago, Christmas time, I wrote a children's book with a company called Brave Books, and it was teaching children how to grow the fruit of the spirit during the seasons of their life. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness. And I wanted to read it at a public library like so many other groups have done with story hours for children. And I was denied by over 50 woke libraries that previously held drag queen story hours for children. So if you want to be a, a, a guy who dresses in fishnet stockings and heels, lipstick and a wig, and get some alone time with some children, toddlers, you can. But if you're a Christian like me, coming to talk about faith, hope, and love, it's a hard no. 
I went and told some of my friends in the news about this, including Tucker Carlson, went on his program and explained to those libraries, your public libraries, your salary and building is paid for by the people in your community. Many of them love God and love this country. That's viewpoint discrimination of the worst kind in America. It's religious viewpoint discrimination. And if you don't change your course, I'm prepared to assert my constitutional rights in court. They changed course. We went to the downtown Indianapolis library who said things like, the, the, the denials were accompanied with comments like, your values don't align with ours. Or my favorite, we're an inclusive community, so we don't want you to come here. <laughs> we're looking for authors of color. This doesn't fit our current agenda. And so when we showed up at the downtown Indianapolis library, where they said nobody was going to show up, we were greeted by over 3,000 parents and grandparents and children who filled six floors of a downtown library so full that the police commissioner said that it was the largest attended event in the 134 years that the library had been open. And no one goes there, especially moms and kids, because of all the riots and the fighting that's been going on since COVID and all the political fighting over the leadership in the library and the funds there. So we had such a great time with so many people on all six floors. We violated fire codes of capacity levels. They were down the escalator, out the street, down into the parking lot. And guess what? When, when all those parents, by the thousands, learned that we were in a tiny little reading room in the back of the sixth floor that only fit 100 people, and in the time frame we had, 2,800 of them would never get in there to get their kids to be able to hear the book. Guess what they did? They didn't start rioting. They didn't start lighting stuff on fire. They didn't start breaking windows with bricks and flipping over cop cars. Guess what they did? The moms sat their kids down in the aisles between the rows of books, opened their book bags, and started having their own little story time hours with their kids, reading their own books of Christian virtue, praying with them, and singing God Bless America and Amazing Grace. <laughs> Guys, there's more of us than there are of them. There are millions that want to go the way of blessing and protection according to God's truths and turn our nation back to the Almighty and to His loving, gracious, protective ways than you would think based on what you see coming out of your phone. Perception is not reality. I'm from Hollywood, the land of make-believe, and screens are very good at making you think you're all alone and that you are on the wrong side of history, that you're a dinosaur with your values, and that all of this is going away in a post-Christian culture. I say, I can't even say it. We're in church. This was the same reaction we found when we went to Los Angeles, California, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Phoenix, and then released another book called Pride Comes Before the Fall. That's a book about, wasn't about pride as much as it was about exalting the virtues of humility. But we happened to release it on June 1st, which was the first day of Pride Month, and we released it at the Seattle Downtown Library. Again, not to come after any group of people, but to exalt humility and down with pride the mother that gives birth to every other deadly sin of, pro of wrath and anger and lust and malice. And we read that in the scriptures. And people are, rumblings of a revival are, are felt everywhere that I go. And I know that this morning... <laughs> You're giving me serious revival vibes right here this morning, and I'm so grateful. Well, this morning, I have a message that I've uh, prepared, and I'm calling it Wanted the Brave. And I wonder if, if, if you would just um, read along with me for a moment, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 8. I'm starting in verse uh, 28 to the end of the chapter. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, 
whom he predestined, he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is it God who just, it is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who then will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Imagine with me that you are in the ninth century AD. These are the 800s. And the Vikings are butchering, torching, and pillaging their way through Britain, devastating everything in their path, city after city, village after village, kingdom after kingdom, until they get to the kingdom of Wessex. The strongest kingdom in Britain led by a man named King Alfred. King Alfred of Wessex was a man of deep faith in Christ and in the scriptures. And he held off the Vikings led by Guthrum, their leader, for seven years until the 12th day of Christmas in 878 AD. It was January and he was finally driven from his castle together with his family, barely escaping with his life and his bodyguards. And he hid out in an impenetrable swamp on a tiny island where he learned how to hunt as a boy with his father. Now, Alfred could have slithered off onto the mainland continent of Europe for some liberty like many of the other leaders within Britain had done to save themselves, but Alfred decided to stay, to fight with his people for truth and for righteousness. And Alfred hid out on a high hill in Wessex in a secret fort overlooking the moves of Guthrum and his heathen horde. And one by one, he would begin to take out their scouts and cut off their supply lines. Life in Britain had become unbearable. The yoke of tyranny, the the raping, the pillaging, the butchering and plundering of all society left the people in utter despair. They thought Alfred was dead. But they began to hear the rumor that he was still alive. And Alfred decided one night in prayer that he would launch one final battle against Guthrum and the Vikings to save Wessex. And he chose a special day, five weeks after Easter, on the day of Pentecost. He sent a message out through his spy network to the men of Wessex to gather all those who had not lost hope Godly men willing to fight for their children, for their families, and for Almighty God to meet him at a specified rock in the middle of the forest named after his grandfather. Alfred arrived to the beautiful sight of 5,000 fighting men ready to stand for what's right. And he trained them and he nourished their hearts and their minds and reminded them of their God taught them how to form what is known as a shield wall where they would lock their arms together and Alfred locked himself in the front of the shield wall and they began to march through 50 miles of the forest to an opening at the base of a hill where Guthrum and his army were camped out at a stolen fortress. And he told his men, be faithful to God. No matter what happens, be faithful to God and he will give you eternal life. And Guthrum, laughing with arrogance at the ease with which he thought he would destroy Alfred's army, they descend on, on, on Alfred and his men. 
And in their shield wall, they march up the hill and it's a clash of shields. And the Vikings were led by berserkers who were driven by drugs and demonic dedication, leaping over their shield wall and Alfred's only to be impaled on the spears by Alfred's men. It was an absolute bloodbath. And then providentially, there was a break in the Viking shield wall and Alfred and his men went through and destroyed the Viking horde. Guthrum escaped into his fortress, but he was surrounded and forced to either starve or surrender. When Alfred took him out of the fortress, the common practice of the day would have been to behead him and his officials publicly. And what Alfred did instead was perhaps one of the greatest acts of grace of the age. He offered to spare Guthrum's life and give him a portion of the kingdom to rule if he promised to convert to Christianity, be baptized, and agree to the Treaty of Wedmore, which would hold him accountable to treat both Saxon and Scandinavian equally under the law in his kingdom. Guthrum agreed. He was converted to Christianity. He was baptized by Alfred. He became the godson of King Alfred. He was given a new name, Athelson, and he fought with him as an ally in battle for the rest of his life. He was so devoted to Alfred that he even had his own coins minted and his name, Athelstan, printed on them. Alfred began to rebuild Britain, and he rewrote the law code. He believed that there was a time in the history of Britain known as the Golden Age that could be revived. It was a time that he had heard was built on the scriptures where mothers and fathers and, and, and churches cherished the word of God and built their families and their churches and their civic society on these life-giving principles. He believed that the future of his country depended on wholesale revival and nothing else. He believed that the Vikings were even sent as a divine scourge to wake up an apathetic and sleeping nation. Alfred's law code was based on the Ten Commandments of Moses and the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus. He believed in the golden rule so much that he said if a man would learn how to love his neighbor as himself and apply it, he needs no other law book. Alfred and his law code later became known as English common law, which was the foundation for modern documents of liberty, including ours, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution. The whole concept of equal rights under law and under God can be traced back to Alfred and his law code. One historian said this of him, he was a fierce warrior, a devout Christian, ever thirsting for wisdom, deeply committed to justice, a lover of mercy, and a king who gave himself for his people. He was practically a myth and a much needed reality. He was the king of the white horse, Alfred the Great. That is a portrait of the brave. Alfred, when he was watching his culture, his country, his kingdom disintegrate and burn before his very eyes, did not sit himself on his couch with his head in his hands watching Fox News and Newsmax waiting for the rapture. <laughs> Alfred was not waiting for Jesus to take him and his family out of the world, he understood the fact that the family of faith had been waiting 4,000 years for God to take the power of sin out of the human heart so that they could pick up their Bibles, apply it to all of the world, and bring heaven to earth for the glory of God. That sounds just like the Great Commission. That sounds like the Lord's Prayer. May, the, may your kingdom come and your will be done at, on earth as it is in heaven. Go into all of the world. Teach all nations. Disciple them. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. That's, wait a minute. That sounds a lot like the original mission God gave to Adam in the garden. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Take dominion over all of it. Oh, wait a minute. 
Maybe it's not about a program just to get people saved so that we can get out of earth and get people to heaven. Maybe it's about making people new creations so that we can colonize earth with the life of heaven and bring God's glory here now. That's what Alfred was going on. That was the program he was running. I travel the, the, the country and I love to talk to kids and parents and politicians and pastors and educators. And I've noticed something. There is a shortage of brave men. There is a shortage of brave men. I'm not a stranger to fear. I understand what it's like to be in risky situations. But I meet so many men who feel absolutely weak. They feel confused, castrated, controlled, masked, vacked, and unable to do anything to change the world around them. Even unable to deal with the snakes in their own head and the demons within their own heart and their life is crumbling from the inside out. I want you to just take a personal inventory right now, men and women. Think of the news. Think of what you're hearing every day. The border crisis, the fentanyl crisis, Russia, China, Iran, Palestine, Israel, your children's education, drag queens at the story hours, everything that's going on in terms of the church and its lack of loyalty to the word of God, the compromises that we're seeing everywhere. How does it make you feel? End times? We're getting there. This is it. It's getting so bad. It's never been this bad before. Are you feeling discouraged? How do you respond? Are you sad for your kids? Are you inching toward the cliff of despair? Do you have rapture fever? <laughs> what if... What if this current cultural setback is really a divine setup for a spiritual comeback led by the family of faith. What if this cultural setback is really a divine scourge sent by God as a divine setup for a spiritual comeback led by an awakened family of faith? That would be a great thing. Whatever it takes, Lord. I've noticed also that there's two groups of people, reporters and reformers, very similar to those who seek to be relevant and those daring enough and brave enough to be revolutionaries. There are reporters who talk about the culture. There are reformers who change and create the culture. Some are whiners, others are winners. Reforming the culture is where it's at. And by the way, we can get excited about reforming the culture and we can turn on the news and we can listen to a lot of really brilliant people, but I am absolutely convinced that trying to reform the culture without the gospel is a non-starter. You're putting lipstick on a pig. You're putting deodorant over the top of a lot of BO. It doesn't fix it. There's a systemic problem that has to be you know, converted and changed and transformed at the molecular level in order for this to be holistically fresh and good and, and life-giving and lasting. I love listening to people far smarter than I am and I'm soaking up everything I can. Don't you love listening to guys like, like Jordan Peterson and, and you think like, how is that? Where is this guy getting these ideas from? And you're wondering, uh, uh, all these brilliant minds out there on the right and the left and I, love, I like listening to Prager and I like listening to so many people who have great ideas. The problem is, without the gospel, they're all stuck in Adam's prison, unable to live up to their own advice. Maybe for a short while you can, but if I'm a slave, if I'm blind, if I'm deaf, if I'm dead in my trespasses and sins, what I need is light. What I need is life. I can't do that. I need the gospel to bring me back from the dead so that I can actually have real wisdom and then do the things that I am saying are a good idea. It reminds me of uh, the beautiful story in the New Testament where Paul and Silas are in prison with the gospel and they can sing hymns to God and they can pray 
And that's powerful. But it wasn't until God sent that earthquake to shake the foundation of the prison and throw open the doors that the jailer and his whole household were converted and they were able to go out, preach the gospel, and literally, the Bible says, turn the world upside down. What we need is not just a bunch of right policy. We can't fix this problem with politics because the problem is not essentially political in nature. It is spiritual in nature. And what we need is for God to send a holy earthquake and a fire to shake the foundations of this country, throw open the doors, and release us from this prison of shame and guilt and fear and pain and set others free with the gospel. Then we can begin to to transform things from the bottom up. True reformers themselves lead with the gospel. Men with changed hearts change their world. Women who have been reformed can now reform their families and their communities. God himself is a reformer, not just a reporter. God isn't watching in heaven as the thoughts of man continually uh, spiral out of control, getting only evil continually and saying, God, can you believe this? Can you believe this? After all, we've done. He begins to reform the world. And he, and he chooses a man named Noah. And God literally puts a period and a stop to the wickedness and to the evil. In judgment, yes. Also, I see it as a, as a great act of mercy before 900-year-old people begin murdering each other and, 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 and extinguish the human race. And this great reset of God begins again in a garden with Noah, a preacher of righteousness who is told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Noah was a reformer. Moses was a reformer. Abraham was a reformer. So was Jesus. He reformed all of humanity. Patrick, Luther, Calvin, William Wallace Braveheart, Wilberforce, the Pilgrims, the Founding Fathers. How did they do it? In the face of their woke mobs, their cancel culture, and government tyranny. Well, I believe that they knew an old recipe that was so old It began way, way before any of their great-great-grandparents had told them. They understood four ancient truths that made them brave. Here's, Here's the first one. The sovereign choice of the Father. Do you know that if you are in Christ as a child of God, God chose you and me before the first of the stars began to shine? He set his his sights on you and he chose you to be conformed to the image of his son, to be holy and blameless in his sight. You're not here by accident. God, God chose you. And secondly, his everlasting love. This wasn't a sterile selection process. This was his his everlasting eternal love that went together with this choice to bring you into his kingdom. And he will always be with you and he will never leave you. And he loves you so much he has sent his son to take care of your sin problem and grant you life from the dead. Number three, the eternal purpose of God to cleanse us, to save us from our ruin, to sanctify us, to call us to our mission and to glorify us. And this goes together with absolute sovereignty and unstoppable love. And finally, the covenant, which in scripture is always described as everlasting. And Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, strikes hands in covenant with God the Father and his elect people. And we have been placed under the shelter of his love and no one will ever snatch us out of his hand. And that forms the foundation of our future forever. In light of these things, how should we respond? Hunker down, hold the line, it's getting bad, wait to be rescued. Black Hawk down, get us out of here, Lord. Don't polish brass on a sinking ship. I say, 
Polish the brass. Swab the deck. Scrape the hull. Stoke the coals. Grab the wheel. Full steam ahead. This ship is going forward, not down. So how do we do it? How do we reform? Well, number one, we need a standard to reform to. Our standard is the Word of God, the infallible, authoritative, sufficient, inerrant Word of God. Everything that we need to be equipped and to flourish as human beings on planet Earth. But in the West, here in America and Europe, we've abandoned the Word of God, largely in our schools, and now we're seeing disloyalty to the Scriptures even in the church and in our seminaries as they're being infiltrated and we're handing it over to others. This is all happening on our watch. And as a result, we no longer have God's standard to reform to. We have become a standard unto ourselves. And now anything is acceptable. Men can give birth. Children can be mutilated through chemicals and other instruments without their parental knowledge in some states here in America. And the list goes on and on and on. How do you show a crooked culture that has become so crooked they don't see the problem? Our children are growing up with a new normal that is unfathomable to us. But they look at us like we've got two heads when we tell them the things that we tell them. How do you show them? Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said said it well. He said, don't waste any time explaining the crookedness of a stick. Simply hold a straight stick next to it and the work is done. Preach the truth, and error is abashed in its presence. We have many reformers in our culture right now who are very effective reformers. Um, Our Supreme Court, the laws of the land, have been effectively reformed to uh, protect evil and to punish good. Family, marriage, even the very basic concept of gender has, has been reformed to a certain extent, and the problem is, these reformers are reforming to the wrong standard. So when you reform without the Bible as your standard, you become a deformer. And we're now literally deforming children in their bodies and in their minds because we don't know right from wrong and good from evil anymore. And this is exactly what the scriptures say is gonna happen. When a people become so arrogant that they want to worship themselves, the creation or anything else that God has made rather than the creator, he gets to a point eventually where he says, here, have it until you choke on it. He gives them over to the dark. The darkness of their hearts and their minds become futile. They think they're so wise, they become fools. And it's a train wreck. We're there. When Jesus was confronted by the religious leaders of his day and they said, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus held up the straight stick of scripture. And he said, you know what is written from the beginning God made them both male and female and therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh and they're now two not one and what God has joined together let not man separate and right there Jesus explained to us everything we need to know about gender marriage and sexuality The pilgrim reformers who came here out of England and all of that um, political and religious tyranny did it. And they did it God's way. They took the word of God, but they didn't force it from the top down. They they grew it from the bottom up. It was an inside out job. It starts in the heart and it moves to the works of your hands. It moves into the church and the community. And then it moves all the way up to the halls of government. That's what you're doing. Dream City Church. You go for for revival in the heart before you go for revival 
in the nation. And the good news is, if this is true, it means the drag queens are not the problem. It means the alphabet army is not the source of our problems. It means that it's not the, the CDC, it's not the WHO, it's not the CIA or the IRS or MS-13, it's not the World Economic Forum or the Silicon Valley rulers who are the ultimate culprits. And by the way, none of them are anything compared to the Vikings. No, I'm serious. They're nothing compared to the Babylonians and what they did to people. They're nothing compared to the Medes and the Persians and the Roman Empire. And, and, and those people who would build gods out of metal and heat them up red hot and then throw their firstborn children up into the arms of these fire gods and have them flip and fry like bacon and create wicker men filling them with moms and dads who were political enemies and criminals and light them on fire to celebrate justice and light Christians on fire to be torches at gladiatorial games in Colosseums. We haven't experienced that yet. And what's interesting in the scriptures, when you read about these horrific things, notice God never said to his people, fear them. He said what? Fear me and I'll bury them. But he also said, if you forget me, I will bring them to discipline you. And he did that over and over and over. He said, if my people will humble themselves and pray and, and turn from your wicked ways, stop pointing the fingers and, and, and just, God sees all of that. He wants his kids to turn back to the father instead of compromising with the call of your flesh and your idolatry and all the things you think could be better if you just made political and personal alliances with the skeletons in your closet or the groups of people who will get you what you want and repent and seek him with all of your heart and then God will forgive your sin and heal your land. I believe he's still interested in doing that with nations today. Reform yourself first, starting with your own heart. Then reform your marriage. Then bring some heaven to your children in your home. And don't stop there. And I know you don't. You're unique as a church. You keep reforming into your friendships, your work, your government, and your culture. That's what Alfred did. You're a church full of Alfreds and Patricks and Luthers and Pilgrims. I have a caveat I want to give to the brave men in the room who may be listening to this and going, Kirk, bro, you have no idea. You should come over to my house. You should see how many guns I have. You should see my truck. You should see the flag that I have raised up over my house. I'm ready to go all 1776 right now. I hear you. But before we go all 1776 to take back our country, we must first go to Psalm 17, verse 6. And plead with God to bow down and to turn his ear to us and to hear our prayers as we surrender to him and depend on him to save us. That is our only hope. A real man, a brave man, a brave woman looks into the mirror first and stares into the eyes of the serpent of lust and greed and pride and anger and crushes its head through repentance and faith. We've got to reform ourselves first. And then when you're proven as faithful in the small things, then God puts you in charge of greater things. So when you see Guthrum and his Viking horde in their longboats coming up over the horizon for your children, when you find 
anger raising up inside of you because of an army with a strange acronym of a jumble of letters looking to groom your children or a government that is looking more and more like metastatic cancer that is deteriorating all of your liberties and your children's future. Don't put your head in your hands on the couch and cry in your Chick-fil-A soup. <laughs> Waiting for Jesus to take you and your children out of the world. I believe Jesus is waiting for you and me and our children to pick up our Bibles and take charge of this world and bring his ways of heaven to our communities and to our nation. We are to be warriors of the best kind, overcoming evil with good, loving our neighbors, forgiving others as we've been forgiven by God in Christ, paving the way and showing them how. They don't know how. You know who got this right? was a German monk named Martin Luther. He understood it. He said, Ein feste Berg ist unser Gott. Ein feste Berg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. He wrote this hymn. Listen to the lyrics. And through this world with devils filled should should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. That's Bible. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are God's ambassadors from heaven placed on the stage of his world to uproot the evil in the fields we know and plant seeds of truth and beauty and goodness. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. The devil is a defeated foe. The death blow was delivered at the cross. His head has been crushed, and he's slinking off to the lake of fire. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He's got no chance in this. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. His kingdom is forever. Sing that with me. His kingdom is forever. God chose you, he loves you, he purposed to cleanse and save you, he's put you on the winning team in his covenant, sealed forever by the blood of his son. You and I cannot lose no matter what happens. One pastor said this beautifully, he said, desperate times like ours call for faithful men, not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, praising them for their courage. If God is for us, who can be against us? Brothers and sisters, I implore you, be brave. God bless you.